Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Molly Yole. I'm from the Office of eLearning, and we are thankful that you are here joining us on a sunny afternoon, at least it's sunny here in Indy, um, after your workday. Um, hopefully, this is a productive time for you, and walk away um, with some new information. Um, I think, Michelle, if you want to go ahead and go to the first slide, um, just a reminder that um, if you want to talk with the group, make sure you select chat with all, um, or if you want to talk to someone individually, you can select them. Um, we will take questions either throughout or at the end, depending on when they come in. Um, so feel free to ask follow-up questions to information that we're providing. Hi, Beth. All right. So before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items just to let you be aware of. Uh, aside from our e-learning um, lab, we also have other professional development opportunities from the Office of e-learning. Um, we do have yet another webinar um, on March 19th um, called Maximize, oh, Maximize the Power of Clever. Um, and that is um, um, going to be a free webinar. Um, we noticed that we have um, a large amount of districts in Indiana that use the service Clever. And so they had actually reached out and asked if they could do a webinar. Um, kind of in, in sync with our network just to give some teacher updates and to provide some more professional learning um, that way. So we're excited to welcome Clever. Um, and then we also are having a webinar about free and open content in April. We haven't started promoting it yet, but we're going to be looking um, and working with some free and open content providers, um, I think three to four, and they're going to share um, the content that they have available to educators across the country. And so that should be um, a really great webinar as well. Um, please, if you are tweeting out anything that you're sharing or learning today um, during the webinar um, on Twitter, please use hashtag INE Learn um, throughout our time together, and then of course daily, but then also if you um, want to join us on Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, we host a Twitter chat each week. Um, this week's chat is titled Blended Digital Learning and Computer Science with moderator um, Jake, who is actually um, a computer science and STEM um, specialist at the Department of Ed. So that should be um, a good chat, and that lasts for roughly an hour from 9 to 10 p.m. I think there's also um, another professional learning opportunity, the Winter Book Club. Um, it is actually um, going on right now. We're in the middle of our book club, um, but it's not too late to join. So if you want some great PD and up to 14 PGP points, um, you are welcome to join um, our Dive Into Inquiry book talk, and then we will start another book club this summer. So we'll take the spring off for a little bit or kind of the end of the school year when things get real busy. So I think that's all of our housekeeping. Um, please make sure, again, that you are muted and that um, if you want to talk to the group, make sure you select everyone in the chat box. All right, thank you for that reminder. Yes, Mary, we archive all webinars, so you can um, access them there as well. All right, so I think we are ready to get started on inclusive design, um, and today we're talking about accessibility, excuse me, for all students. Um, I am Molly Yo, like I said, and then joining us is Michelle Eaton and Diana Gill, um, and we're going to kind of tag team on and off throughout the presentation. Ladies, do you want to introduce yourself? Say hello. Hi, I'm Michelle Eaton. I am the Director of Virtual and Blended Learning for the MSC of Wayne Township. Um, this topic is near and dear to my heart as we design a lot of online content for traditional classrooms, for blended programs, and for our virtual high school. Um, so we spent a great deal of time really diving into these nine elements of accessible design. So I'm excited to be here and uh, chat with all of you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Diana Gill. I am the Instructional Technology Coach at East Porter County Schools up in Northwest Indiana. And I also serve part-time for the Department of Education 
Office of eLearning as an Innovation Specialist, and I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you, ladies. Yeah, it's great to have um, different perspectives, and um, Michelle runs the virtual learning um, school at the Misty of Wayne Township, and so she actually um, provided the the backbone of this presentation because this is something that she does with her teachers a lot, and it's so important, um, such an important topic for all of us to um, be aware of and to make sure that we're practicing and modeling for our colleagues and for our students as well. So, all right, let's go ahead and dive in. What is accessibility and why is it important? Um, so there's a shift in Indiana. <laughs> as most of you know, um, and more and more districts are moving away from traditional print materials, and many are utilizing digital instruction materials in a variety of formats. And with this change, um, teachers are becoming more and more um, curators, um, more than ever before, creating their own materials for their classroom. Um, and so because of that, it's so crucial that all education stakeholders um, understand why accessibility for all students is so important. Um, students with disabilities often face barriers to academic access, success, and completion, and as curators and creators, we must ensure our students have an equal playing field. Um, advocacy and deliberate and inclusive pedagogy can level the opportunities for all learners. Um, and so we want to make sure that as students' instruction changes, um, that we are making sure that they still have equal access to all the materials, um, regardless of the format. All right, so um, quickly uh, and briefly, because we have so much information to, to discuss, we're going to talk about the legal compliance um, with this. Um, so let's discuss um, all that us educators um, need to understand and respect to ensure that all of our students um, receive free and appropriate education. Um, there are two federal laws that pertain to the needs of individuals with disabilities in the United States. Um, under Section 504, Indiana students with disabilities cannot be denied access to the academic and extracurricular activities of their non-disabled peers simply because of their disability. Um, the latter is Title II of the ADA, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in all services, programs, and activities provided by uh, or provided to the public by state and local governments. Um, in a school setting, the ADA covers students, parents, and employees, and the ADA also covers academics, extracurricular activities, and athletics. Um, specifically, students may not be denied a service or program because of their disability, um, and schools must provide programs and services in an integrated setting unless separate or different measures are needed to ensure that equality. Um, schools must guarantee effective communication, and schools must operate programs that are accessible and usable by individuals with disabilities. Um, all of this includes equal access to instructional materials, both print and digital, and access to necessary assistive technology. And so it is our responsibility as educators um, not to be experts on the law because we're not lawyers, um, but we need to be aware of what our responsibilities are and we need to make sure that we are making that playing field um, equal for all of our students as um, their access to information continues to change. Michelle? So to get us started, let's really talk about um, what accessibility is and how it's different from another word you probably often hear, uh, being accommodation. So access, at the heart of accessibility, we're talking about equality. We're talking about leveling the playing field for our students so that when they come to us, whether that's an online classroom, um, a face-to-face -face classroom with digital materials, whatever the case is, that they are able to engage and access materials right from Jump Street. Um, so accessibility really is all about the proactive approach to how we design content and experiences for our students. Um, it's, it's ensuring that the content that we use is free of barriers um, from the very beginning. Um, that means we're using pedagogical approaches like universal design for learning, or we are looking at the technical standards that are identified in Section 508, 
or the web content accessibility guidelines, um, which this entire presentation is based on. So you don't have to know all of those guidelines, um, but if you can walk away, we're going to tell you kind of the, the nine major themes here that you'll, you'll see in those. Um, when we use those standards and those pedagogical practices, we can, from the beginning, make sure that our content is accessible, not just for some of our students, but for all of them, um, and make our digital content kind of accessible right out of the box. Now, accommodations are the things that we do during instruction to meet specific needs um, or unique needs for a student that we can't do ahead of time. Um, so, for example, if the learning objective of an online music course requires a student to listen to a, a classical piece and then identify by ear key aspects of that piece, then an accommodation for a student with a hearing impairment would be more appropriate than altering the assignment as it is being designed. Um, however, if an objective requires students to visually identify written lyrics, then during design we can ensure that um, a student with low vision can access the content by using a screen reader and no accommodations would be needed. Um, why this is important? Um, this is important in, in all spaces, not just online, but um, I, want, I want to tell you a little bit about specifically from an online classroom where students are completely uh, remote. If we, have, if we have content, we're relying solely on accommodations, um, if a student comes into an online course or um, an e-learning day or just wanting to do some digital homework and we are relying only on accommodations, then that student has to wait on us to make changes. Um, and instead, if we can be proactive in our design, we can make sure that they have the same amount of time, the same start time as anyone else, um, and they can get going immediately. So accessibility and accessible design is not going to eliminate the need for accommodations. We're always going to have accommodations, but it certainly can um, help level the playing field for students. And I will also tell you um, that regardless, it's a legal requirement. We, we have to make, as Molly was saying, we have to make our content accessible. And I can speak to you very specifically from um, experience that it is a lot easier to design accessibly from the beginning and do that proactively than to react to uh, a need for accessible content and try to retroactively do that. Um, it takes a lot more work on, on the back end. So um, this, is, this is best. I know when I first started really thinking about accessible design, learning all about it, um, I kind of had this panicked moment that I've been doing this wrong for so long and I have published so much digital content that is not accessible. And I'm going to be completely frank with you. I was extremely overwhelmed right at the very beginning. Um, and I want to save you from that panicked feeling that I had because what I had to come to terms with was I'm going to do the best I can and, and, and try to correct the things that I've done. But ultimately, my personal goal, I can't speak for the other presenters, but my personal goal for you as we're going through this presentation is to know better, do better. Um, I may not have made the most accessible digital content in my past, but moving forward, because I know how to do it, I know um, what I should be creating, um, everything I'm making moving forward is accessible. So give yourself some grace. Um, because this is this can feel a little bit overwhelming if you try to put the pressure on yourself of thinking about everything you've ever created. Um, so I, I want to I want to share that with you. Um, before I really dive into the nine considerations, there is a, a Chrome extension that I think um, many of you might find really interesting. It's called Funkify. So if you find it in the web store, it is an extension that allows you to experience a web page um, through different lenses. So you can see here in this screenshot, um, you can experience the, a, a website from the perspective of someone who has, um, who doesn't have uh, the fine motor control to use a mouse. Um, so that's something that we would often see. And so you can kind of look at a website and identify with a student um, how that might 
feel for them moving through. You can look um, at a website through the eyes of someone who has color blindness. And, um, and see how maybe the colors that are selected on a website can impact someone um, with that visual impairment. So I really like this as I'm give, finding and curating materials to give to my students, or maybe I'm creating slides uh, um, for a lecture. I like to use this extension just to quickly kind of visually see how accessible a website is. Um, and, and this is really helpful if you are aware of um, specific needs within your classroom. Um, the first of the nine, um, the first of the nine elements that I want to talk about is text formatting. Um, headings and list structure actually can be accessible or inaccessible. What I mean by this. Um, if you have a large piece of text and you have headings or subheadings, I want you to imagine if you um, are able to take a look at a screen with an article or a book um, that you have in front of you. If you do not have a vision impairment and you're looking for a specific piece of information, you don't have to read an entire textbook or an entire chapter or even every word on a web page. We use list structure and headings to help us identify which sections we need to read. Um, this is a really important skill for, for um, reading digital print or digital uh, text. Now I want you to think for a moment um, that you're not able to read the screen and you're relying solely on a screen reader. Um, being able to skip through sections of a website or sections of a text is still a really important um, skill set. However, if our headings and list structure are not accessible, then a screen reader can't tell the difference between um, one section to the next. So for a student who can't physically see the screen, for them to find information, they'd have to listen to the screen reader read the entire text. And then, um, goodness knows if they had to go back and find information after they've read it, they're going to have to listen to that whole page all over again. Um, so it definitely does not level the playing field for those students. So um, this is one of the simpler with ways we can make our content accessible. When, if you make a heading and all you do is bold it or underline the text or make it larger, a screen reader cannot tell the difference between bold text, italic text, um, it's all just text and it's going to be read um, as such. So if you are creating a document or you're designing within your learning management system, instead of creating a heading and making it just bold, actually use the list structure uh, drop-down that's available. So here I'm in Google Docs in this uh, GIF that you see, and I'm actually using the heading one, heading two, subtitle, list structure, and that will automatically be accessible. If you are designing in something, a web tool, uh, like an LMS that maybe does not have that drop-down, if your LMS doesn't, what you can do is type out this content in Google Docs or in Word and copy paste it into the text box. And generally, um, it will copy over the code that comes along with it that makes it, that tags it as accessible, that tags it as a heading. Um, so that's kind of a, a little hack if you're working within a platform that doesn't have that list structure. And I don't have the chat up, so if any of my co-presenters see questions um, that I'm not seeing, please let me know. I'm happy to address any. Okay, I'll be on the, the lookout and chime in. Awesome. Um, there's a lot of other um, <clears throat> accessibility pieces of information. Um, we're going to share with you a handbook at the end of this webinar that you can take with you, and it, it has even more content about selecting a font um, and the way that we uh, use text. If you are really wanting to uh, do a deep dive, if you go to this URL here, WebAIM is kind of the leading website, I think, on web accessibility. Um, all of their resources are based on the uh, web content accessibility guidelines. And there's a lot of information about the types of fonts that are accessible um, and the types that aren't. 
Um, generally, a lot of this is common sense, just thinking about finding really readable fonts, um, avoiding ornate fonts um, in our content, just because it makes it really, it's difficult for anybody to read. Um, but then if you add on some sort of visual impairment, um, kind of makes it even more difficult. Um, and that's also something to really consider here. A lot of this um, work is absolutely necessary for some of our students, but ultimately when it comes down to it, um, if, we're, if we're cognizant of the fonts that we're using or the colors that we're using, um, the things that we're doing for some of our students end up being good for all of our students as well. The second um, accessibility element I'd like to talk about is uh, for PDFs. So when we share PDFs um, as digital content, there are two kinds. There are accessible PDFs and inaccessible PDFs. Um, an accessible PDF is one that can be read by a screen reader. There are some really quick and easy ways to test if a PDF is accessible. So if you can highlight the text, you open your PDF, and if you try to move your cursor and highlight the text, let me show you in this GIF what it looks like. So here in this GIF, you see my, my cursor is moving. I'm trying to highlight that text and nothing is happening. That means the screen reader can't see it. But on the second one, if I am trying to highlight and it's actually highlighting each individual word, that means that a screen reader um, can likely read each of those words as well. Um, Another way to check it is if you are on the PDF and you just do a quick control F, which is the shortcut to do the find on this page uh, function. If you can, if I were to do a control F on this document and look for a word that I see, if, if it's able to find it, that means that it's readable and it's accessible. If it can't, then it's not accessible. Where I see this happening a lot is um, if we are photocopying pages from a book, um, a textbook or a novel or, or whatever, um, most copy machines are not going to be able to make that accessible. Um, a, an accessible PDF is one where maybe you've taken a website and converted it to a PDF or taken a Word document and converted it to a PDF. Um, generally speaking, if we're going to be making copies of textbook, we'll probably have to ask ourselves some questions about copyright anyway. Um, but that is something to consider. Uh, the third one is use of color. There are two things uh, re regarding color that either make our content accessible or inaccessible. First of all is the contrast between colors. Um, so if we think about students who are colorblind or even the the number of students who don't even realize that they're colorblind yet. I think I'm a former second grade teacher, um, so I constantly think about those kiddos that haven't even realized that they're not seeing colors in the same way that, that I am. Um, the contrast between colors makes things readable for uh, those with colorblindness. And then additionally, how we use color to indicate action. Um, so the first thing, um, is the contrast. We need to have a high contrast between colors. Obviously, if you think about, I'm sure you all have received presentations created by students that are um, not easy on the eyes. Um, I want you to think about a fuchsia background and lime green font. Um, no one likes to look at that, but then our students who are colorblind absolutely cannot see it. Um, so we need to check for that contrast. Additionally, if you think about someone that um, is colorblind, if they are on a website, and I think um, when I think about color as an indicator, this is something that I never noticed until now, and now I can't stop noticing it. So I, sh I would apologize, but no better, do better. Um, you guys are never going to look at another form the same way ever again. I think about going to a website, and if I'm signing up for a webinar or a newsletter or subscription or whatever, or I'm filling in my credit card information for my online shopping problem. Um, one of those things. If I am filling out this form and I notice that um, the, the field name is written in red and address is written in red and the rest is written in black, um, someone that can see the color red 
I generally know that that is indicating um, a required field. So if it's, if it's in red, I know that I have to fill it out and I won't be able to complete the form. If I were colorblind and I could not see that color, I have no way of knowing what the required fields are. So often, uh, when we're designing digital content for students, we might say, if you see the blue font, do this. Or we indicate something is special by using a specific colored font. If our students can't see that color, then they don't have the same advantage as other people in our class. So um, if you're going to use color as an indicator, you have to have some other um, accessible uh, alert. So if we're going back to the form, it can be, it's not that you can't use the color red to indicate that something is required, but you also are going to need an asterisk or in parentheses, you need it to say required, something that indicates regardless of color that, uh, what that action is. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing, uh, when you are creating content and using color, I highly, highly recommend this resource. You can either write down this URL or you can just Google Web Aim Color Contrast. It'll be the first result. This tool I have bookmarked and I use it almost daily. It allows you to identify the background color and the foreground color and see if it passes, uh, if it's accessible. It is uh, pretty simple to use and pretty straightforward. So this is what this is what it looks like. I will say, just generally speaking, if you are wanting students to do any sort of sustained reading uh, more than a, a sentence or two or a couple of words on a slide, always, always, always use white background black font um, because on a screen, anything else can be very difficult to read. So when I'm talking about using colored font and a background, I'm really talking about when you're creating images or infographics or PowerPoints, something where there's very minimal text. Um, but again, if you're having students read a paragraph or two, it needs to be black font with a white background. Um, so this is what the contrast checker looks like. Um, I put in this blue background and this kind of lime green font to see what the contrast ratio was. You can see here um, that it passes for large text um, at all levels and one level for normal text, just to decode what this means. Um, looking at the screen next to the pass fail, you see WCAG, that's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that we've referenced. And the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for all accessibility standards have three levels, A, AA, AAA. A is kind of the most baseline, kind of basic uh, conformance. AAA is the, um, the most stringent. It requires the most. So when I think about, if I were to think about um, video captions for videos, the most basic level is that you have to have closed captioning for all videos. The highest level, I think, is closed captioning, a transcript, and you have an additional video of um, someone doing the, the video in American Sign Language. Um, that's the highest level. I may never be able to have that, that level of conformance. Um, for my online courses, that might have to be an accommodation. However, I can do level A. When it comes to color, I generally, what I tell um, my teachers is that it is not that difficult to reach triple A level. Um, so I, our rule at Achieve Virtual is that everything has to pass at the highest level um, of contrast. So this is what it looks like for normal text. There's like 14 font and large text. Here's what it looks like when you fail. So what I did was I'm, I'm changing the color. You can either use the color code or just um, kind of guess. So I'm gonna make the text yellow and the background color this nice salmon. <laughs> and you can see um, that fails across the board. So that would be uh, colors that you would not want to use. Um, are there any questions or about using that tool? Um, Daniel McNulty commented um, from Patton's project. He said he often opts for a black dark background and a white text. Um, okay, cool. Sometimes it could, yeah. Um, 
kind of wash out for some people with black and white. So um, sounds like you guys are on the same track there. Um, Kelly said these tools are helpful. So thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for chiming in with additional content. Um, the fourth element, um, animations and visual effects. Um, there are a few things to think about here. Uh, remove any flashing or blinking animations. There are, um, and Daniel might actually be able to chime in. I don't have it written down what the actual speed is um, that is inaccessible, especially for people with seizure disorders. Um, but I generally like to play it safer than sorry when it comes to anything that's flashing and blinking. So if I'm on a website and I'm noticing that something is flashing, I generally uh, will not use that website or I'll convert it to a PDF so that it's not moving. Um, so uh, you want to remove any flashing or blinking animations. It's just not safe. Um, and then I, um, if we're making PowerPoints, I even, uh, and this might be me being a little bit um, extra cautious, but again, um, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I even say, you know, if you're going to be trying to use fancy transitions in PowerPoint or in slides to make sure that they're kind of slower, um, I generally don't even use transitions between slides, um, but using slow, simple transitions, um, I switch out websites with flashing content or ads. And then the other piece um, is RSS feed. So if you're on a website that has a Twitter feed embedded, um, technically, for that to be accessible, you have to have the ability to stop the feed. Um, so if an RSS feed is running and there's no way for me to stop it from moving, um, then technically that content is inaccessible as well. Um, so make sure that they, all RSS feeds have a pause option. All right. Diane, um, here? Number five focuses on hyperlinks. And as you know, hyperlinks are very common to our digital content. And they work with all platforms, but the way that we execute or create our hyperlinks can make that link inaccessible for some users. So when we are designing content, we have to think about hyperlinks in the context of a user who might be navigating that digital content through the use of a screen reader or other assistive technology. So some things to keep in mind for this including a raw URL or just a URL that isn't hyperlinked to any text would be very difficult for a user to navigate. So remember that a screen reader would take a URL like that and would read the hyperlink exactly as the link text is written. So think about those super long URLs with tons of special characters and tons of numbers that are really long. A user would have to then listen to every single one of those characters being read and after all of that would still not be clear on where that link would be taking them. So um, another thing to think about when we create hyperlinks is that we make the common mistake of typing something like click here or click here for more information. And we do that with good intentions, thinking that we're making our content look nice and clean. We're not using just that raw long URL. Um, but with, with good intentions, we're making our content inaccessible to some when we do that click here thing. So in this scenario, the user would still not know what they're accessing. Screen readers can also allow users to skip from one hyperlink to the next, um, or they might ask students to navigate through a list of hyperlinks, and without any context, students would be left navigating content that has a bunch of click here um, without context. And so if we're asking students to navigate to multiple links, they have to be able to differentiate among them, and they have to know you know, am I access, accessing the right one um, so I can find what I'm looking for? So instead, a quick win here is to describe the contents of the link in our hyperlink text. So in this example, a correct way to do this would be web accessibility information. That's our hyperlinked text instead of just the website um, name or something that says click here. We also want to think about, um, you know, I've seen designers do the thing where they say click here for, and then they'll describe the content of that link. And just think about um, what a screen reader does. A screen reader will make it clear to the user that they're reading a link. So it's redundant, and it's just not necessary to type out link to and then describe the content. 
So one quick, easy change we can make to make our content more accessible is when we are designing a hyperlink, we are just simply describing the contents of that link so that students can navigate and differentiate among those links um, with context. Wonderful. Um, the other thing we have to think about is how images can be read. We've talked a lot about screen readers, um, and screen readers have to be able to read images too. If we're designing digital content and designing it well, we know that images and text um, work better when they're together, and we should be using visual media that is important to the learning and not just there to make it the content look pretty. Um, but if we're actually adding images that add value to the learning, then it's going to be also important that our students uh, who might have a vision impairment are able to benefit from those images as well. So the way that we do that is by including um, what are called alt tags, um, alt text with the images. Um, and these are just descriptions. Um, that would adequately describe the image and what, what the user is seeing. This can look different um, depending on what platform you're in. Um, so the, I wanted to do, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to actually go in and, and do a demonstration. Um, generally, wherever the image editing is, um, often it's when you're even adding an image, so in slides, if I right click on the picture, I have alt, alt text as an option and I can edit it there. Um, within my learning management system, it's actually when I upload the image or if I go to image options, um, I can see alt text. Now, an alt tag um, is not visible. So um, technically in this PowerPoint, um, you would never know it by watching but this image of the six has an alt tag on it. Um, so you don't see it. It doesn't mess up um, the visual look of your design. However, if someone was going through my slides who could not see that image and they were using a screen reader, the screen reader would identify this is an image and then share whatever that alt tag was that I had placed there. Um, so it's absolutely critical that we do that. Um, none of your students will know it's there unless they're using a screen reader and need it. Additionally, um, oops, sorry. sometimes I think about um, things that require longer descriptions. So if I am sharing a chart or a table, um, a bar graph that has a ton of information in it, um, it, it's going to require something longer than the one line that I will have in the alt tag. So um, for our teachers, I have them, if they need to require a longer description of an image, to open up a Google Doc and type out that information and then link to it below the image. Um, so that's how we handle longer alt tags. It doesn't really, when you're, when you have an alt tag, um, box or you're filling in that descriptor, it's just one line. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a longer description. So um, that's how we handle, handle that. We basically create a transcript of this image and link to it below. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so before we continue on, um, I want to talk about really quickly a resource called Grackle Docs. Um, there's also Grackle Sheets and Grackle Slides because 70 plus percent of our Indiana districts are G um, Suite users. And so this could definitely be helpful to many of you. Um, it covers most of the accessibility features that we've mentioned up until this point. Um, I will share in the chat um, the link to Grackle Docs and how it works. Um, so basically it's an add-on that runs through Google Docs, like I said, and when it opens up, um, it can scan your current document for accessibility issues. Um, it runs automatically, um, and then um, it gives you this um, report that you can then view. Um, it scans for um, issues with images, headings, tables, landmarks, um, and content, 
And then you can see a breakdown and a report on the right hand side of your screen once you run it. Um, and then it gives you um, like what passed and where your errors were. And then you can drop down and see specifically like what you need to fix. And it'll even give you some suggestion, suggestions on how to fix it, depending on um, what the error was. So it's, um, you know, it doesn't probably um, cover everything, um, but it's definitely a great start. And it does cover, like I said, the hyperlinks, the alternative images, the heading and text. Um, so a lot of those things that maybe aren't natural to you as a curator and a creator yet should be checking for. Um, so this is just a great, you know, check that you can run and see a report and then helps you kind of get into the habit um, of making your document accessible. So um, if you have questions about that, um, I think they have a really informative website. Um, they even have a video getting started with Grackle Docs that kind of walks you through how to use it. But I was actually introduced to this in the fall from um, the National AIM Center, some of the representatives from there. So it's a pretty great resource um, and it's helped me a lot just to kind of point out the things that I, um, you know, aren't checking for. Um, and, it, and it's a good, it's a good, just, you know, uh, filter for me. <laughs> And I had never heard of that. I was so excited to learn about it. Um, it is really handy and pretty intuitive too, which I, I really appreciate. There are a lot of accessibility checkers out there that I think are a little bit intimidating um, because I think they're written more for people that are developing the websites. And um, most of the time, I'm not even sure what it is I'm looking at. And I really like Grackle Docs because it just, I feel like as an educator, it's something that I can understand. 100%. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely not the designer or not the developer and just kind of more of the design. Um, when I'm, you know, trying to get hyperdocs ready for kids and for PD. And so this is just a great check for me um, just to kind of hold me accountable, if you will, and then to be a good model for others. Awesome. Um, the seventh element has to do with keyboard navigation. Um, sometimes I think I take for granted the fine motor skills that I have um, and how something like using a mouse um, is easy for me and not something I, I think too much about. But uh, you could potentially have students coming to you um, using your website or your digital content who uh, lack those fine motor capabilities and can't use a mouse. And in those cases, it's usually much easier for students to navigate digital content using their keyboard. And this is kind of a, an interesting activity. And one of the options in Funkify um, is um, to actually experience a website. It takes away your cursor um, and your mouse control, so it requires you to use it as a keyboard. Um, so when I, this is kind of an interesting activity. If you were to go to some of your favorite websites that you send students to, or even the websites that you like to use and see if you can move through the page without using a mouse. Here are the things that you can do. Um, first, if you hit the tab button um, on your keyboard, that should on an accessible website take you from one link to the next. It should jump from uh, and move down links down the page. So that's a way to move down a page. You can also uh, generally use the arrow keys to scroll down. Um, shift tab will move you backwards a link. So you can move backwards by jumping uh, links. And then if you're using tab and it kind of highlights a link, if you hit space bar or enter on an accessible website, it should activate that link and take you there. Um, so this is just a, a really interesting activity and it doesn't take too much time at all. It's something that I never gave much thought to at all until I started really thinking about accessibility. And now if I'm creating digital content and want to send um, my kiddos to a website, before I copy paste that link, I just do a couple of tabs, shift tabs and enter just to make sure that the website can be navigated using the keyboard. All right, number eight, we're gonna talk about video captions and transcripts. So adding transcripts and captions to multimedia content can make that content accessible for users who cannot rely on audio alone. Captions are the text narrations of audio content that would then be synchronized with the audio. 
Um, and captions can also be very helpful to non-native English speakers. Um, on the other hand, transcripts are a written account of the audio content, but not necessarily verbatim. They might also include um, narration or descriptions of visuals or helpful comments to help the users maintain context. Um, and for video content, you should provide both captions and transcripts. And all of those together should adequately share the same information that would be provided by the video with the audio. So a way to add captions and transcripts to your video content that you own easily is to utilize those two features inside of YouTube. When you upload your video content to YouTube, it will automatically generate captions for your video um, for the content that you upload. And there is a default language and you can get into the settings and change what that default language is. Um, but YouTube generally does provide pretty accurate captions. I will see some mistakes in my stuff, but I can get into the captions and edit those if there are any mistakes in the um, YouTube video manager. And from a user perspective, those closed captions can be turned on or off, and you can even go in and modify those closed caption settings to change the font and the background color and the font color um, and all of that. YouTube will also auto-generate a transcript that you can edit as well and sync it with your video or audio content. And the user can get these transcripts by clicking the three dots at the bottom of the video and choosing Open Transcript. You can also change that default language for the transcripts. And users can toggle uh, between time stamps, stamps that will be synchronized with that video um, content. Taking that step, to upload your video content to YouTube. I know that when we create content as teachers, we don't always want to put it on YouTube. We might want to house it um, in Google Drive or something. But taking that extra step to upload to YouTube is a quick way to make your content more accessible without having to create all of those closed captions and transcripts by hand. And you can still decide how private your videos are by taking advantage of that unlist feature um, in the YouTube settings when you upload. So by leaving your video unlisted, I just feel like it's important for us to think about the privacy too. Um, we can share it in a way that only people that have access to that link can find it. And I can't just hop on YouTube and search for your video if you don't want people to be able to find it. Um, so if you aren't using, or if you are utilizing video content that you don't own and you're finding it online um, and it doesn't have closed captions, you should be using transcripts. And that's why I encourage people to create their own video content and upload to YouTube because it can be very cumbersome to manually create those transcripts. And um, just to add to that too, um, I'll often use audio files in my digital content as well. Um, and so even with audio and not just video, uh, with audio files, it's always important to have a transcript linked below it as well. And generally, what I do that is helpful um, as I'm designing digital content is I write the transcript first. It takes a lot of time, guys, to like listen to a video or listen to an audio recording and try to keep up um, by typing out exactly what is there. And so if I'm going to record audio, this is an example of how proactive design is generally a lot easier than reactive design. Um, if I am going to be recording audio, I type out a script of what I'm going to say, and that becomes the transcript. So then I read that for the audio file, and I generally sound a little bit more polished than I normally do if I'm just off the cuff. And then I, have a, I can link to it directly and make that the transcript. Um, and that generally, while it takes more time than designing inaccessible content. Um, we are not in the business of, of trying to intentionally create things that make it difficult for some of our students. So um, it's definitely less time consuming than doing it retroactively. The final element of accessible design that we want to share with you um, has to do with math equations. Um, it's something um, that you have to consider because often math equations can be shared as images. So, um, and a lot of it depends on the type of math equation editor that you're using. So, if you are creating 
um, we found this in some of our online classes that we had to retroactively come back and fix. I had some teachers who were creating the math formulas in Word and then taking a screenshot of it and adding that image into the learning management system. Well, now if a student um, is using a screen reader, they have no idea what that image says. So for those, we end up having to add an alt tag and typing out what it says, um, not necessarily using the characters, um, but actually like thinking about how a screen reader would read that equation or that formula. Um, so you either need to add alt tags if equations are shared as an image, or you need to use designated apps and extensions that use what's called MathML. That's the Accessible Math Equation Editor language. Um, so for, exist, uh, for um, example, in Microsoft Word, the built-in equation editor is accessible. Um, a really quick way to check to see if, you're, if the learning management system you're using uses an accessible equation editor, again, if you highlight a math equation and it highlights it as a box around that equation where it kind of looks like it's highlighting an image, then it's most likely not accessible. If you highlight an equation and it is, you can see it individually highlighting each character, then um, it's more likely that a screen reader can actually read that. So if you're installing an app or an extension, take a look at the fine print. Um, look for words like MathML or some designation that indicates that it's accessible um, because you need to make sure that our equations can also be read by a screen reader. Well, as much as I love math, that's important to know. <laughs> so, and I'm kidding because I'm an English person, but I do appreciate Molly, we can't hear you. Oh, sh well, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> so sorry. Um, I don't even know what I just said, but I'm sure it was, um, it can be repeated. So um, thank you for sharing that. And then I was just highlighting that Kate had mentioned another tool that she uses, the webcaptioner.com. Um, and I said, as if you're not already overwhelmed today, um, deep breath and making it a point moving forward to just do better and start implementing these tips and using resources like Grapple Docs to check ourselves and to make sure that we are creating content for all students. Um, we're already better for it. So, um, there's a few other resources, um, the Indiana Patents Project. So Daniel McNulty um, is from the Patents Project, and he's been chiming in and providing some resource information for us. So thank you, Daniel. Um, his team is wonderful. They have all sorts of professional development opportunities. Um, they do Twitter chats. They have a conference. Um, they're often at many of our summer of e-learning conferences. Oh, tonight they have a Twitter chat. Perfect. Um, yes, and they are located at CIESC um, on the north side, I believe. So they are an indie and easily accessible to everyone. And I, they are wonderful um, to hop on and, you know, do a short webinar or just a meeting with a group of teachers, provide you with resources. Um, so we really appreciate the Patents Project. Um, and then another group that I have found very um, very valuable is the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials, the National AIM Center, which um, is paired with the USDOE. Um, they have some great resources. Oh, you have offices and staff all over. Wonderful. Um, they have some great resources um, to, to share, and they actually just started doing online learning modules. And so they've slowly been releasing them. And at the beginning of each learning module, they have about an hour webinar, which you can go back and view the archive version on YouTube, and then they have modules that you can walk through on your own um, and learn more information about that topic. And it's all centered around ensuring that your digital instruction materials and print materials are accessible for all students. Um, and then they also um, provide other professional development opportunities as well. But um, I am loving their free modules with those YouTube um, videos, um, and that's all just been released um, since the beginning of the school year. So they're a great resource. Um, and then they're actually having an upcoming webinar. Let's just call it, so give me just a second. It literally just came through um, and I wanted to make sure I shared it with you guys. Um, 
it's within the IEP, where do accessible materials and technology fit? So let me throw that link in the chat box because that's super relevant to our conversation here today. Um, we'll do some wonderful webinars. Um, and then other learning opportunities um, that I wanted to make sure you were all aware of, and this is um, being updated by our office. Um, we have the instructional materials, professional learning opportunities um, that are not just around accessibility, but all different kind of subtopics of um, digital content curation and creation. So we're going to have a Creative Commons workshop all about copyright law and licensing in March. Um, and then we're having another professional learning opportunity about student inquiry and using primary sources from the Library of Congress, which are all public domain resources. Um, and that's going to be in April. And um, generally, we are able to pay for sub reimbursement for districts. And then all of our workshops, like our webinars today, are free for teachers to attend. All right. Um, I believe, Michelle, are you going to talk about the handbook? Yep. Um, I just wanted to offer you a free handbook um, that goes over most of everything that we talked about today. This is a handbook that we use with our virtual high school, Achieve Virtual. Um, and um, I, I wrote it just as a, a quick guide as you're designing digital content. So if you think that would be useful to you, you are welcome to um, take it and print it or use it digitally. Uh, but that is the URL to access it. And it is a handbook all about creating accessible digital content. Well, I think we timed that almost perfectly. Um, so if anyone has questions, um, I will watch the chat bar for just a moment. And if not, I'm sure you're ready to get on your way and have a peaceful evening, hopefully. Thank you for sharing that handbook, Michelle. That's so helpful. And don't forget to share anything you learned today. Hashtag INE Learn. Um, and to follow the Patents Project Twitter chat tonight. Thank you for um, including all of your resources, Daniel. All right, it looks like we don't have any questions. So Mary, thank you for producing. Michelle and Diana, thank you so much for sharing all of your wonderful expertise. Um, we may be overwhelmed, but we are all the better for it.